Well, um, I believe that it's uh, exactly 12 midday and time for our webinar to begin. Um, friends, colleagues, experts, welcome to this webinar to launch a special issue of the International Review of Psychiatry on the Climate Crisis and Mental Health. So what are our aims uh, for the webinar today? Jess, if you'd show the, the aims, that'd be great. The event is intended to mark the launch of the special issue of the uh, International Review of Psychiatry, raise awareness of the mental health impacts of the climate crisis globally, uh, explore some actions to protect mental health and emotional well-being as the crisis progresses, highlight the role of the mental health professions in helping communities cope with and act on the crisis, encourage more of your colleagues to contribute to climate action and to celebrate and thank the many authors, reviewers uh, and, and uh, webinar uh, organisers uh, who've contributed to this special issue and to making this webinar happen. So uh, uh, next slide, please, Jess. Um, the, the usual uh, tradition, as we know, is to acknowledge uh, the efforts which go into making a, uh, a, a, an event or an issue a success towards the end, but I'm going to break with tradition and uh, uh, thank some, some people and, and, and acknowledge their effort, which has made all of this possible to be brought together. First, a big thank you to our editorial team, uh, uh, my own colleagues from Imperial, Neil Jennings, R Richard Powell and Emma Lawrence. Now, without you, this really, this, this issue would not be um, available today. So thank you very much for your help. A big thank you, of course, to all the authors who have been um, uh, tireless in, in giving their time, uh, their commitment, their enthusiasm and their effort to put all these papers together. Next slide, please, Jess. Uh, and now on to the reviewers who are often not thanked. Um, and, and, you know, they've, they've given uh, generously of their time to critique our papers, to strengthen them, to improve them and make them publishable. So thank you to our reviewers. The editors, of course, uh, Professor Dinesh Bugran, Professor Margaret Chisholm and, and the journal team who've been again unstinting in their support in bringing the special issue together. I believe it's a first for them in uh, putting something together on, on the climate crisis. And of course, a very big thank you uh, for the webinar planning and organisation to uh, our colleagues at Imperial, Jack, Adrian, Deborah, Sherelle, Jess, Nick and many others um, who've, who've allowed us all to come together here today. So thank you for that. Now, um, you know, uh, on to uh, some housekeeping. Next slide, please, Jess. Um, you, you can all um, use the Q&A function to share your questions, your reflections and your feedback. So please do so. Now, unfortunately, because this is a tight packed one hour agenda. We won't have the time to answer all your questions. However, uh, Dr. Neil Jennings, one of our editorial team, is monitoring the Q&A um, box and he's going to be publishing some of the questions. Uh, he's going to select and publish them and we're asking our speakers um, if the questions are relevant to their topic and expertise to, um, to answer. The, the, the questions in the Q&A box, even as the webinar is progressing. Uh, what we will do is summarise all your feedback and we'll publish it on the Northwest London ARC um, website, but do bear with us, that might take up to a month to uh, put together. Uh, and, and, and also please be aware that your comments are incredibly important because they will feed into other events such as the Planetary Health Alliance meeting, which some of our authors um, are, 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 will be attending and will be speaking at at the end of October. So um, next slide, please, Jess. Um, now on to um, the first of our sessions. Um, what are the mental health impacts of the climate crisis? The signs of climate breakdown are all around us. Uh, the effects on health are enormous, they are growing uh, and include an increasing toll on mental health. And here to give us a glimpse of the impacts are authors bringing a wide variety of perspectives. And I'd like to begin by inviting Emma 
the lead author of an in-depth review, I believe is the most comprehensive to date ever, of the evidence on the global burden of mental ill health resulting from the climate crisis to highlight the key findings from your paper, please. So over to you, Emma. Uh, many thanks, Muller, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah, we can. Fantastic, fantastic. So as you said, Muller, it's been a pleasure to work over the last months in bringing together different literatures uh, that have explored the wide range of impacts um, and pathways of impacts of climate change on mental health and emotional well-being. We know that the climate crisis is a health emergency and a mental health emergency. And why this is, is that mental health really relies on a, a huge array of interconnected determinants, as they're called. And, you know, our individual mental health and well-being relies on our social um, structures and our communities. It relies on our living and working conditions. It relies on the co wider cultures in which we live um, and the uh, societies and economies uh, in which we live and work. And unfortunately, uh, climate change is disrupting the conditions we need for good mental health and well-being. And it's doing so in ways that exacerbate and compound existing stresses and inequalities on individuals and populations around the world. And we're going to hear some of these uh, stories today from our other uh, collaborators on this issue. And so some of these pathways of disruption are things like from directly experiencing higher temperatures or experiencing extreme weather and climate events like fires and, and droughts, but then also the downstream pathways of, of those um, compounding stresses, so food and water insecurity, um, disruptions to livelihoods, disruptions to connections to culture and, and the landscapes in which people uh, practice their, their spirituality, their culture, their livelihoods, even people having to move away from um, their homelands. Uh, and, and even being aware of uh, these growing threats, um, either from your lived experience or from even watching this unfold around the world and the inaction of leaders is causing distress and understandable strong emotions. And while those uh, strong emotional responses and psychological responses themselves can be an ongoing stress and pressure that can worsen um, people's mental health and well-being, they can also act as a driver of action and a motivator of change with the right support. So what we highlight in this issue is how uh, climate change is a risk multiplier for mental health, but also it's an opportunity multiplier if leaders take action. And we highlight by bringing together again these different literatures, the work of uh, the IPCC and the work of researchers uh, and different cultures around the world that have showcased if we take action to um, limit the use of fossil fuels to improve air quality, improve access to green space, improve cultures that better care for people will also um, better care for the planet and vice versa. And so we summarise uh, the action um, that we need really relies on connecting these uh, diverse um, disciplines and taking action by connecting across sectors. And so it's such a pleasure to be here as part of this group today where we are taking uh, you know, action um, across sectors here as researchers and practitioners and young people um, to act on the planetary emergency in ways that will hopefully ultimately improve equality and mental health and well-being. Emma, thank you so much for that. Now, may I turn to Monica, Nazish and Michael. We're so fortunate that you're joining us from South Africa, Bangladesh and the Caribbean. Do the findings that Emma's just described resonate with the challenges in your regions? So please tell us how is climate change affecting emotional well-being in your countries and your geographies? I mean, maybe maybe begin with with uh, Monica, perhaps, please. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Mona. I think a lot of what Emma said feeds into what, uh, what I'm going to say today. Um, there might be a, a few nuance or exaggerations uh, within the African context, which I will highlight. So I'm based at the University of South Africa, and I also just want to thank the Imperial team um, for the initial invitation to contribute to this edition. And mine is a commentary article, so I'll just touch on the, the key points. So um, 
think the first thing that stands out is that Africa is ecologically sensitive. I and mean, if we look at, uh, you know, the global context, um, whatever the forecast is of, of global temperature rise, um, it's predicted that Africa will be double that. So if we're looking at a 2% globally, Africa is predicted to have a 4% rise. Um, so that, that is really catastrophic. Um, also, um, it feeds into what Emma said, that there will be an additional burden, and there already is, um, on, on the mental health sector and the healthcare infrastructures within Africa. Um, we are also looking at, at uh, the, the sort of exacerbation of the anxiety, depression, trauma, PTSD, and suicide, which I think is, is, a, is a global tendency. Um, but, but individuals with pre-existing mental health or health conditions will be more exposed and defend, defenseless to these changes. Um, just for an example, uh, falling temperatures and extreme heat exposure has been um, associated with heart and aggression and other associated mental health concerns. Um, but within the African context, what really stands out is impose, these imposing challenges uh, and how they converge with climate change. So we sit in with the largest HIV AIDS problem globally, uh, particularly in South Africa and Sub-Sahara Africa. And um, it, it's noted that there's likely a syndemic relationship between the HIV epidemic and environmental degradation. However, we still need a, a very robust evidence base um, to determine exactly what the, the risk is. Um, but then we're also looking at food insecurity, uh, the ramifications of uh, colonialization and the resultant inequality. And then also the big issue with the, within the African context, and I've done some research locally in South Africa, is the actual health care system, um, which is ill-prepared for uh, uh, pressures that climate change will, will cause. I think the, the one, and also we lack mental health sufficient capacity in the mental health sector and so the health sector, we just simply don't have enough professionals. Just maybe one last thing to say that is positive is that the um, majority of, of African, sub-Saharan African governments that I'm familiar with are, are acknowledge climate change and want to be proactive. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Nazish, um, tell us about the Bangladesh situation, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my our paper was on mental health and climate change in Bangladesh. So today I'm going to try and present a few of the highlights from our paper. So an important thing to note at the very beginning is that according to the Climate Risk Index of 2020, Bangladesh was ranked seven amongst the worst victims of climate change. Um, however, we're considered to be a global leader in disaster management. Every year we spend approximately 5 billion US dollars, which is around 2.5% of our GDP, on climate change adaptation and resilience building. So unfortunately, our country faces catastrophic impacts of climate change that could end up resulting in a 6.8% loss in our GDP per year by 2030 if we don't address it right now. So for this reason, to build Bangladesh's resilience, to make sure these impacts don't affect our country's prosperity, our government has actually made a Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan for the decade 2030. And this was launched under our second tenure as president of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. So in the Mujib Plan, we've included a number of new and strengthened adaptation efforts that we hope is going to build our resilience in populations and ecosystems. And the hope is to shift the traje trajectory from vulnerability to resilience to prosperity, ultimately. In the Mujib Plan, we have a special focus on well-being measures in terms of both physical and mental health, like cleaner air, promotion of healthy lifestyles, access to greener spaces, and special support for mental health challenges. Um, another initiative that our government has also taken uh, is the introduction of a crisis preparedness and management for mental health program. This has been done in collaboration with our Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief. 
And um, it's great to know that it's now actually a part of that ministry standard operating procedure. So whenever we have any kind of a crisis or an emergency, uh, we're able to deploy participants who have been trained from different backgrounds uh, to be able to provide that mental health support at the community level in the event of a disaster. So um, I think our government, by working in a collaborative way, in a multi-sectoral way, of course, the responsibility can't only be for the Ministry of Environment, which ends up happening in most cases. But for us, we've seen that we really need the different ministries to kind of work together. Health, environment, disaster management, it's all interlinked. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind when we're trying to address the impact of climate change on mental health. And I'd just like to end by saying that I believe one similarity between the recent COVID-19 pandemic and climate change is the vast impact it's had on mental health. The pandemic's loss of life, widespread morbidity, job and income losses and isolation are truly having a real and profound psychological impact. The same is true for natural calamities as well, which have been found to increase the prevalence of mental disorders among the affected communities in the time following a disaster. So I think um, we're hopeful that the way the Bangladesh government is trying to address it now, that ultimately we'll be able to work through it. Thank you. Thank you, Nazish. Now, uh, you know, uh, I believe um, Bangladesh was uh, uh, a member. Indeed, you might have held the presidency of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And, and Michael, uh, the Climate Vulnerable Forum includes uh, the Caribbean, too, as I understand it, um, with the small island states and their particular problems. So tell us what it's like in the Caribbean, please. Hi, good uh, morning. <clears throat> From Barbados, good afternoon for uh, other people or good evening. Um, I think that the notes that I have about our paper are variations on themes that are emerging from other authors, which um, uh, which says something, I think. Uh, one of the things that we are uh, experiencing now, right as we speak in the Caribbean, is the uh, tension between acute vulnerabilities and threats and more creeping kind of vulnerabilities is you know many of you know following the news we have hurricanes moving uh through the region today uh doing considerable damage and they'll probably do more uh in the next few days and so that is a that is a reality of of life in the caribbean but at the same time these creeping threats in terms of sea level rise and temperature change pose threats to um, landscape and economic well-being and ultimately to um, physical and mental health. And so uh, the overlay of those things is important. And I think we should keep in mind that sometimes the acute threats can take up a lot of bandwidth and, uh, and we need to be planning and responding and researching and acting um, uh, for both types of threats. Uh, and in that sense, mental health professionals have really emerged as uh, important players uh, in the last few years, and that has accelerated with COVID, but uh, a lot of the uh, mechanisms were in place before. And so regionally in the English-speaking Caribbean, but also in the Spanish-speaking Caribbean and Dutch-speaking and Creole-speaking Caribbean, um, that uh, mental health groups have been working with ministries of health, with governments, with faith-based organizations, uh, and directly with community groups, providing psychological Psychological first aid and providing more traditional types of uh, mental health interventions, but also in consulting roles and advising roles for broader public health response and planning. Um, and uh, in that regard, you know, one of the things that struck both Natalie and I writing the paper is how collaborative and transdisciplinary everything that we're doing around climate health 
uh, really uh, is. In fact, you know, I'm a psychologist and Natalie is a public health faculty member with uh, expertise in palliative care. Uh, and so that just our paper itself is evidence of, of that kind of cross disciplinary uh, work. Um, and I would also just one more thing to add, I think, and, and this may be the case everywhere, but it's particularly salient in small island states, and that is that um, individual resilience and broader types of resilience, structural resilience, community resilience, economic resilience are really intertwined. And that is uh, especially evident here because in small island states, so many people have different roles and nobody, you know, everybody is vulnerable to direct impacts of events. And so, um, and so that is the situation in which we are. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. Now I'm going to move, move us on to Sasha. And uh, Sasha, you represent a group of young people who came together to write a paper. I believe it might be the first paper written by young people to share your perspectives and feelings in a peer-reviewed medical journal. So would you like to summarize for us the key points from your paper, please, about your feelings and also your expectations of the adults around you? So Sasha, over to you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to join you all today. Um, our paper entitled Not About Us Without Us actually uh, provides a first-hand account of the feelings and the hopes of about 23 climate-concerned young people uh, brought together from 15 countries around the world. Um, so while there's no way that we could hope to speak for everyone's experience, uh, we hope to encapsulate a variety of perspectives um, from young people who are often spoken about but are not often given the opportunity to speak for themselves in academic contexts. Um, so, as you alluded to, I believe it's the first time young people from so many countries have been able to record their feelings in an academic journal, actually in their own words. Um, so it was very important to us that their lived experience was considered a legitimate form of expertise, um, especially for those young people who very bravely shared firsthand accounts of climate related distress and extreme weather events. So this paper is personally important to us for many reasons, um, and it may also be emotional for people reading it. Um, although our authorship group comes from 15 countries around the world, uh, it was absolutely remarkable as the process unfolded to see how much we had in common, both in our feelings of distress about the status quo, uh, the ways we wanted to be supported with our feelings, and the ways that we wanted society to change in the future. So in the end, it is a raw account of the understandable grief, despair, distress that many young people experience in the face of the climate crisis. Um, but at the same time, it's also a map towards a better future, uh, highlighting the individual mental health support that young people who are concerned about the state of the world want. Um, and also the structural changes that come with that, uh, the structural changes that young people want from policymakers to help build compassionate societies more broadly. Thank you. Sasha, thank you so much for that. Now, very quickly before our session ends, I just wanted to um, ask you a quick question, a sort of almost a yes, no question. Do we believe, having heard all of this, that there's adequate awareness, you know, of the extent of the climate anxiety or indeed the need to support um, those experiencing uh, this anxiety and channeling it uh, to constructive uh climate climate action i mean what 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 do we think you know what what's what's happening around the world and also among young people i mean do we do young people talk talk amongst themselves and uh, do you think there's i know you can't all speak for everyone but but what's your perspective on this i mean should we just start with sasha you know literally a yes no sasha before we conclude yeah Hello? Oh, can you hear me okay? All good? Yes. Um, great. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a big question. I'll try to keep it brief um, because I think it's important that individuals and communities are able to self-define how the climate crisis in influences their mental health. But as a whole, based on the conversations I've had, the privilege of having through my work, 
Um, I actually think people of all ages have been led to believe in many cases it's abnormal to care deeply about the climate crisis, um, when in fact it's a sign of our compassion and our empathy and our connectedness to the issue. Um, and unfortunately, many young people I know who are brave enough to share their sort of sadness and frustration about the climate crisis are sometimes criticized as naive or oversensitive. Um, and although policymakers are the ones who can take the greatest action to address the climate crisis, I do think that mental health professionals also have an important role to play in really validating the concerns that people have about where the world is heading. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that currently the most ardent voices for action are coming from the countries most disproportionately affected by the climate crisis, and they are also the ones who contribute the least to it globally. Um, and so our paper really hopes to contribute to this effort to center their stories, understand how these experiences, instead of being disordered, um, need to be validated and understood. So as illuminated by previous authors, to wrap it up, we have to cross pollinate between these disciplines, really linking up the dots between community resilience, traditional knowledge, medical systems and social support networks. Hopefully that was brief. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, thank you. Thank you. So, so we, you know, literally we need to move to the next session. But I, I'm so tempted to ask uh, Nazish, uh, Monica, Michael and Emma for literally a yes or no. Do we believe more needs to be done or do we do we think there's enough enough, uh, you know, acknowledgement of climate anxiety out there? What do you think from from Bangladesh? Nazish, yes or no? Your country is a leader um, in in uh, in you know the way it's it's led uh, the climate. Um, Professor Mal, I think you went on mute. I wasn't able to hear. Yeah, uh, I just said uh, you know Bangladesh has shown great leadership, but at the community population level, uh, yeah. is there enough? Uh, you know, acknowledgement of climate anxiety. Just yes or uh, no, we really must move. No, I don't think. No, no. what do you think, no. Monica? Um, I think I think at the grassroots level, uh, action needs to be taken. But what I think is the first key point is we need robust modeled studies. So before we yeah. can get, before we have that, we can't get enough funding or, or pol movement and policies and, and that type yeah. of thing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Michael, in the Caribbean, yes. Oh, no. no, and um, looking to pathological models to explain anxiety um, mm. is often not helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's important. Emma, globally, yes or no? What do you think? Yeah, so I think there's at a grassroots level, there's incredible work being done for pe by people like Sasha and many other organisations. We've actually um, done a study bringing together the interventions around the world and there's almost no academic or sort of literature or evaluation of them, but there is great work to learn from if we can compile that. Um, and at a policy level, there is not awareness. So we looked at um, parliamentary discussions in the UK. There has been zero mentions of climate anxiety or eco-anxiety of young people in UK parliament to date. So yes, there is great work being done globally, not at the highest levels of policy and practice, which is what the work needs to done, be done to brought together and inform that. Thank you all so much. That's been such an enlightening introduction to the scale of the challenges we face, and it leads us expertly on to the next two sessions, which are going to be chaired by Dr. Adrian James, the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Over to you, Adrian. Thanks so much, uh, Marla, and I'm joining you from my uh, clinical base. Really great to uh, be with you all. And I want to say a big thank you to you, Marla, for the uh, the work you've done in putting this special edition together. And there's such richness in these discussions and that should encourage all of us to, to read the special edition and find out more. So uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists is really committed to addressing climate change. Climate change is a health issue. It's a mental health issue. And it's, it's humbling to hear those accounts from all over the world about the, the direct effects on the environment but also on on people's emotional well-being but also the amazing work
work that's uh, that's going on. So let's hear more about that. And uh, we're going to go on to hear more about the broader association between the natural environment and mental health and the specific role of nature restoration as an effective intervention. And I'm going to come to Judy uh, first. Judy, fantastic to have you with us, painter, poet, environmentalist, and of course, uh, honorary president of the Black Environment Network. Judy, could you summarise your thoughts on this and uh, your paper? Over to you. Thank you, Adrian. My article is on the untapped potential of nature-based activities for mental health. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us that we need immediate substantial action to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. A growing body of research is showing us that an increasing number of people are experiencing climate impacts now and are so concerned about apparent insufficient sufficient response that they are suffering from negative reactions, including eco-anxiety. Nature-based activities, from accessing urban green spaces to arts activities, connecting people deeply with nature, all conservation work have a potentially important but currently neglected role to play in supporting those experiencing eco-anxiety. In the UK, social prescribing is a significant framework that seeks to address health needs holistically by enabling general practitioners and other care staff to refer people to various local non-clinical services. However, existing research limitations hinder the adoption of nature-based activities through commissioning in mainstream clinical and social care provision. There's a great need for investment in research that enables our understanding of the individual and community benefits of nature-based activities, the longevity of their impact and their associated comparative and opportunity costs. Otherwise, nature-based activities risk being trapped in a vicious cycle, insufficient commission initiatives with which to undertake effective research and insufficient resulting rigorous research to justify new initiatives. Mental health professionals are central to championing such research alongside the voices of those that are most affected. Judy, thank you so much for outlining the evidence base. And it's it's really important to hear that many of the actions that we can take have such a positive benefit on mental health. So as a mental health community, we should be marching towards the action that we need to, to take. So thank you for emphasising that. And Nick, over to you as a child and adolescent psychiatrist and uh, founder of the EcoCAMS working group at the college. Tell us about your paper and uh, uh, your your thoughts about this. Thank you so much, Adrian, and um, thank you to the um, to the editing editing team of this uh, really special and really important special issue of uh, the International Review of Psychiatry. We were very honoured to to be asked to contribute a paper. Um, we, being a kind of group of child and adolescent psychiatrists, psychiatrists with an interest in public mental health, and also an ecologist, um, kind of coming together to put put a paper that really is a commentary paper, seeding hope, restoring nature. Um, to restoring ourselves. And I think that that really summarises where where we see um, the, the sort of role of uh, sort of nature restoration and nature connectedness, because actually it is about helping ourselves, helping ourselves kind of get a, a real sort of sense of where we belong, kind of arguing very strongly that we've, we've probably lost um, as, as a sort of society, particularly in, in, in predominantly in the West, We've lost that lost that sense of connection uh, with where we where we feel um, we belong within within our sort of planetary system within our sort of sense of, of global health and so our argument within the sort of commentary piece is very much about there is there is no health without thinking about planetary health it is a reciprocal relationship between the two it's not something that we can kind of separate out and we can kind of think of nature as another but very much we are within and part of nature I think our our article therefore talks to uh, really recognising uh, 
the need, in fact, the right of access to healthy environments, the right to, of access to green spaces, and that perhaps was even more clearly demonstrated during um, the COVID pandemic. But I think it also spelt out the inequalities that existed um, and the sort of social injustices that occurred in response to that um, and, and sort of really brought out the, the reality that if we're going to talk about nature restoration, if we're going to talk about access to green space, we also have to talk about the barriers and the injustice that results in people not being able to access green space. So it is an issue of health inequality. Um, it's an issue of social injustice as well as an issue of nature connectedness. Our article talks about making a sort of um, sort of comments and, and suggestions, ideas around how healthcare systems can work. And we've we've heard already about social prescribing and how that can uh, be used and, and utilized and so on. But I think we're asking people to sort of think even more sort of broadly about, you know, the whole um, sort of the NHS estates and so on. And you know, the, you're talking about considerable areas of land, but also to think very strongly about nature connectedness and uh, restoration and programs that involve those those types of activities as very genuine interventions that will actually make a real impact on not just children and young people who, who we mostly predominantly work alongside but but all people in terms of having their opportunity but there's something very much about being outdoors being very hands-on getting your hands into the soil and actually doing something collaboratively and collectively with others but it needs to be done very much alongside and with organizations who are able who have the expertise in these areas you know organizations like the wildlife trusts who've got a very good evidence base for a program of nature restoration like trees for life to run the rewild and recover type program our arguments are therefore about healthcare systems. It's about um, the role of health professionals speaking out, making sure that we connect, we, we, we make real sense of what's going on and, and recognizing that sort of nature restoration has a, a clear role and fundamentally saying, you know, it's about access to green spaces and nature restoration is a right. And it is also about a way of addressing health inequalities. This is the UN decade of nature restoration. Let's make it have a real impact. Thank you. Nick, thanks so much uh, for that. And I think making that point, there's no health without mental health and no health without planetary health and inequalities at the centre of this and a growing evidence base. And we really need to, to stress that evidence. So thank you so much, Judy and Nick, for your contributions. We're moving on to uh, three uh, further uh, excellent speakers, David Philippa and Rajeshri. And uh, David, I think we're going to come to you first and again about this evidence base uh, around nature based activities in child and adolescent mental health services. So David, summarise your your paper. Great, thanks so much. So so our paper was a qualitative paper that looked at exploring exploring the experiences and practicalities of integrating a nature based approach into an inpatient CAM service. It's actually part of an evaluation because the participants have received some facilitated training by an organisation called the Natural Academy. Um, unsurprisingly, um, through the findings, the discrete activities that people mentioned, which is sort of what's just been mentioned now, are things such as using crafts and gardening, getting the hands in the soil, having walks and practicing things such as mindfulness. But I think some of the more novel findings of our paper were really about how staff were using nature to enhance some of the existing interactions they have with young people in situations such as risk assessment formulations, therapeutic sessions and so forth. Some of the main points we got for the benefits of doing this were um, when you have a, a nature based setting it enhances physical and psychological safety. So it provides a less restrictive environment it provides young people the opportunity to speak up a bit more. And alongside that, it provides this lovely natural setting where people feel they can have candid discussions. It breaks down, it breaks down that power dynamic and allows people to walk alongside the staff member that's supporting them and allow them to have a bit more of a candid discussion and more of a, a co-productive discussion, which is really quite important when we're thinking around how modern mental health is provided. And then collectively, when we're thinking about introducing young people to discrete activities or some of the um, techniques they can use, such as mindfulness, relaxation, going for walks, it sparks that interest for something they can take forward themselves. It empowers young people to be able to use this beyond their setting. Um, linked, but quite a little bit separate, is the is the benefits for for staff. So staff well-being. Um, some of the staff recognise the importance of being able to take out lunchtime walks, 
have that segmented time for themselves to be in nature and really how it made them feel. And alongside that, of course, if you give staff the opportunity to have nature based activities, they're going to be benefiting from it as much as the young people. So it's really a, a holistic view on how we can provide mental health services. Just very quickly moving on to the practicality. So some of the insights we have about maximizing integrating nature based approaches into these settings is it's really important to have that whole system approach and that people do understand the ethos of introducing nature and making sure we understand about the climate crisis and what it means. And training does really help for that. Well, firstly, it helps to create a, co a core cohort of people that are interested, but it's also really good for those people who may have an interest in nature, but aren't quite confident with how they can integrate it into their practice. So it helps those people that might have an interest, but might not feel as confident. When we're thinking about integrating nature, it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be. It's great to be able to take a minibus and go to specific activities, but actually can be relatively straightforward things. It can be things such as lunchtime walks or bringing nature into the setting itself. It can be as straightforward as that. And just chiming on from what Nick said, uh, one of the final things I want to mention really is making sure we integrate community organisations and charities when we are looking to have nature based activities in these settings. Um, for one, it's an extra pair of hands when we're thinking about resourcing, which we know is a difficulty within the NHS and I'm sure internationally as well. You absolutely get the subject's expertise and the passion that those community organisation members or charity members bring. And of course, when we're thinking about young people sustaining their interest, when you incorporate a community organisation or charity, it provides them with the opportunity to hopefully um, carry on that activity beyond the setting if they're in an inpatient setting, for instance. So I think that's particularly important. So really, in some, our paper was relatively short, but it's a starting point, hopefully, to think about some of the practicalities of how you can meaningfully bring nature into an inpatient setting. Thank you. Well, that's um, great um, to, to hear that, um, David. And again, look at the, the article. I've read every single one of them and uh, they're all uh, fantastic if you really want to uh, find out what, what you can do practically about this issue. But of course, as more people get involved in, in climate change and want to do something about it, activism is at the centre of all of this. And Philippa, you've written a credible paper on uh, what are the benefits of this? What are the pitfalls as well? So tell us about your, your paper. Yes, thank you, Adrian. As you say, after hearing from everyone today, some of those might be raring to go already, want to get up from their laptop and go and do something right away. But others might also fe be feeling quite overwhelmed or tentative about what to do with the magnitude of all of this. Um, but a benefit of activism is that it's really good for people in both of those positions. And that's kind of what we explore in this commentary article that we wrote as um, a group of mental health professionals, part of the activist group Psych Declares. We need to recognise that our individual lifestyle changes can only go so far. It's the wider reaching and more impactful change that needs to be done through our actions as a profession and our role in lobbying for global government action. And as mental health professionals, we're really beneficially placed to be activists. In our day to day work, we already work with quite marginalised populations advocating for their wider determinants of health. And we come with a very trusted voice by members of the public. And we're really good at having those conversations that cross these murky environmental, social, political boundaries that we've been speaking about today. And the benefits of activism are not just for the patients, the people we do it for, but they're actually really good for us. So research has shown that activism can protect and nourish our own mental health through that kind of collective action, working together on a, a communal kind of goal pathway. And that's really important because a pitfall of engaging with activism can really be those difficult emotions that Sasha spoke about in eco anger, climate anxiety. And as well, recognising the commitment that we have to put in alongside our already quite busy jobs, daily lives. But collective activism can be a way to share out those responsibilities and help maintain our energy and focus. But we also recognise in our paper that there are lots of other barriers for engaging in activism, especially around that perceived negative activist stereotype people gluing themselves to things and being arrested and maybe losing their licence. I mean, it's scary. But we debunk 
a lot of those myths in our article and we also show that activism is not limited to just civil disobedience. Many Many activists are quieter, take on supportive roles in public outreach, medical education, building awareness. And ultimately, each person just can do what suits their capacity, their skills and circumstances. And we, we really hope in our article, um, I think you guys get the link afterwards, to inspire mental health professionals to do that and provide quite practical points about how, can do, how they can do that um, as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Philippa. And it's really important to emphasize that the, the 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 health voice on this is so important because we we tend to be more trusted than than other voices. So the climate change lobby really want us to get in involved with this because the public do listen to us. So uh, get involved in a, a, an activist group. And as you say, there's many different ways that you can contribute. And these groups can be of really good for your well-being because you're in part of a supportive uh, community that looks after each other. So thank you so much for that, Philippa. And, and our final uh, speaker in this uh, uh, section, uh, Rajeshri, uh, I just wonder if you could highlight to us what would make a difference in the, the pastoral communities in the Sahel in, in Africa? Um, again, a, a great uh, a, a great paper, but also a humbling and, and distressing. Thanks, Adrian, and thanks for giving uh, me the opportunity to join today's event. Um, so I work in a large climate and development programme, working with pastoralists and agro-pastoralists in the Rhineland regions of the Sahel. And uh, in the uh, commentary piece that I co-authored with Guy Jobbins as well, we uh, talk about climate change and psychosocial resilience and the need for more evidence. Now, in the climate community, generally, there tends to be more of a focus on the material basis of climate resilience. So looking at things like addressing poverty, investing in infrastructure, technology and, and innovation rather than looking at the psychosocial components of climate resilience or what shapes well-being more broadly. Now, this neglects an important part of what climate resilience is, you know, the willingness and the ability of people and groups of people to come together to overcome adversity. The previous speakers have spoken about floods, you know, erratic uh, weather patterns, uh, disasters, that kind of thing. In the climate community, we also know very, li very little about psychosocial climate resilience and the way that it is impacted by other forms of psychosocial well-being and stress. So for example, conflict, legacies of colonialism, top-down development programmes. And so in our commentary piece, uh, Guy and me, we kind of touch on the fact that we really do need more knowledge and more of an emphasis given to the psychosocial dimensions of climate resilience. And what this means is we need more funding of this kind of research in climate and development programs. I mean, at the moment, only a fraction of multilateral climate finance is devoted to health adaptation. And of that fraction, a very small proportion goes into mental health and psychosocial interventions. And also in tandem, echoing what some of the other panelists today have spoken about, we also need more culturally nuanced action research that trials and then evaluates the potential impact of psychosocial interventions on climate resilience and on climate and development goals, which means that we need more transdisciplinary collaboration between dry lands, climate and psychosocial experts and specialists that genuinely engages dry lands people in the design, in the implementation and then in the evaluation of these interventions. And I think if we don't do this, at best we are missing an opportunity to gain valuable insight and at worst we run the risk of missing a significant component of what climate resilience actually is. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rajeshri. That's a really important, uh, appropriate way to finish this uh, uh, the third section and uh, I guess the, the the need for more evidence, more investment and I think the this special edition of the International Review of Psychiatry really helps to make that point that we uh, it, it puts it out there into a, a, um, a, a global platform and uh, 
the, the and, and, and helps to uh, make that case further. So thank you so much, uh, David, Philippa and Rajeshri. And I'm going to hand back over to Marla and thank you again, all of you so much for your contributions to the special edition, this webinar, but more importantly, all you do uh, in this important area. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Now we're 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 drawing to a to a to an end, and this is a a, a great uh, you know place where we now focus a little bit on the particular role of the mental health professions in the uh, climate and mental health crises. Uh, and, and we're very fortunate that we've got Sophie who's representing the mental health professions in the UK. We've got John from uh, with, with, with lived experience of one of the most highly vulnerable regions in that part of Asia. And you've written a paper on the Philippines, John. So I'm going to I'm going to ask you, Sophie, and then you, John, to tell us a little bit about what is the role of the mental health professions, given the scale of the action required from more evidence gathering all the way to getting our system leaders to start recognizing the link between food security and uh, and, and mental health? And then I'm going to come on to you, Ching, um, uh, and, and ask you to uh, just just to and perhaps share your call to action. Sophie, first, please. Sophie, you're on mute. I know. Thank you for including me today. So I was part of a paper where which we wrote together of eight mental health professionals from across the globe, so some from the UK, but all over the globe. And we came together to share our experiences of engaging with the climate crisis. And I think one of the things that emerged most strongly from those conversations was the role of mental health professionals in guiding both personally and professionally the emotional and behavioural changes that we need to go through in processing the scale of grief and eco-anxiety or what's also going to be called cultural trauma um, as our world gets displaced and changes. And those look, can look different in the UK from you know, floods which change communities or in Barbados where safe zones get distorted by seaweed and can't go to school and there isn't access to water. And all these um, have an impact on our mental health in a systemic way. And I think what we all shared, despite our different experiences, that as mental health practitioners, we have a real role in advocating and in promoting these more systemic paradigms of mental health, where we no longer locate so much in the individual. Um, and so I think you know, also in our, a big part of us was to share that kind of personal and professional sense of uh, confusion and emotion that emerges in this space that can normalise our experiences so that as mental health professionals, we don't have to feel like we know what to do. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so it's also in modelling those processes to other mental health professionals. And that was part of the paper it was designed to do was for people to read that and recognise their own experience in that um, and perhaps embolden people therefore to step forward and say, yeah, me too. <laughs> I don't know what's going on or I, I feel angry and scared as a mental health professional and that we could come together and work together in that in that way. Thank you so much, Sophie. There are some interesting things going on in the Philippines. John, would you like to share with us what you've, uh, uh, you know, what you've highlighted in your paper? Many thanks, Mala. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in this journal launch. I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of my uh, great uh, colleagues in the Philippines, Renzo Ginto, John Riv Gilaron, and Sena Salcedo. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share the main points of our paper. And in the paper, we highlight that the Philippines is one of the most vulnerable uh, to the brunt of climate change, despite having very minimal contribution to global greenhouse gas emission. The country has to deal with the severe direct consequences of climate change. For instance, the Philippines faces at least 20 typhoons per year, most of which are super typhoons, killing thousands of lives and ruining people's livelihoods. In fact, just yesterday, our country faced a super typhoon, which caused fear and trauma to many Filipinos. And many people died, some people are still missing, and many Filipinos have been displaced. 
We also experience indirect effects of climate change, like sea, le sea level rise. Imagine that happening in, in a country with more than 7,000 islands, uh, heat rise, and um, many other indirect effects, which affect mental health. True enough, the first global survey of climate anxiety showed that the Filipino youth is the most climate anxious in the world. Since the world is unfortunately not on track to meeting the net zero goals in 2050, more young Filipinos might face mental health consequences of climate change in the future. And in the paper, we highlight that the country's community of mental health workers must embrace climate change as part of its healing mission and step up its efforts to respond to the emerging mental health needs brought about by the climate crisis. Fortunately, there is recent progress in the climate change and mental health nexus in the Philippines. For example, just last week, the Nas National Conference of the Psychological Association of the Philippines had the theme climate change and mental health. This is an important step in increasing awareness among mental health providers in the country. The next step, in my opinion, must be equipping the mental health providers with the skills in addressing mental health concerns related to climate change, which requires systemic changes on how we train mental health providers in the country. The goal is to harness the youth's emotions about climate change to spark climate action and justice. In achieving this goal, we highlight in the paper that mental health providers in the country must take the opportunity to broaden their perspective and incorporate climate change in their conceptualization of mental health. Mental health providers indeed can contribute in creating a world that is livable, safe, and just for everyone. I'll stop there. Thank you. John, thank you so much for that. So having, you know, it, I mean, I, I am, I, I've been left absolutely breathless by what I've what I've heard. So, Jing, what is your rallying call to the professions and beyond? What what does your paper say? Thank you, Marla. So our take home messages from this paper, which has already been expressed so much by other speakers in this webinar, is that not only is it essential to highlight, emphasize and support the significant mental health burden and emotional distress that relates to the climate and ecological emergency, it's equally crucial not to pathologize these experiences, but rather to understand them as valid, rational and adaptive responses when engaging with the reality of our collective predicament and the relative lack of proportionate coordinated responses that currently exist on tackling the issue on a structural level. For me, one of the further take homes in our paper is that it's helpful to understand the psychological and emotional responses to the climate crisis as lying on a continuum with suffering and distress on one end and denial, avoidance and indifference on the other, and that it's perhaps these latter responses that are more concerning and more prevalent as we live in a society that is collectively dissociated from the reality of things. So for us, the rallying call is as follows, that we need to recognise that the climate emergency is the defining health emergency of our time, that as health professionals, it's our duty and our remit to protect against the key determinants of global health and well-being, and we need to advocate for a quality of life that goes beyond the minimal definitions of what is survivable. Furthermore, that when these threats are perpetuated by systemic failures to bring about adequate change, it also becomes our duty to hold key organisations, corporations and governments to account for the structural changes that are needed. And I think as Michael and others have said already, in addition to this, for mental health professionals, we are bestowed with the crucial skills for supporting and processing difficult experiences, for bringing about change so that these difficult experiences in relation to climate can be understood, processed and funneled into collective action. And what's more, we have the communication and relational skills needed to bring about effective collaboration across sectors in order to affect the structural changes needed on a larger scale. Jing, thank you so much. Now it's it's time for me to draw the webinar to a close. So all that remains for me is to once again thank everyone who has brought together the special issue and the webinar launch. Please read the papers. I believe that uh, uh, Neil Jennings has now shared the uh, URL link on, on chat. 
So um, please, please, uh, please do take a look at that. Uh, you know, thank you all. What amazing speakers, what amazing authors we've, we've uh, brought together here. I'm really grateful to you all for your help in putting, putting together this special issue, which I hope will be a landmark in once again accelerating uh, 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 action and bringing many more people uh, to and encouraging many more people to recognize that we all have a role to play. So now I'm going to invite Jennifer Uchendu, one of the co-authors of our paper on young people's perspectives, to have the last word. Jennifer, over to you. Thank you so much, Mala, and thanks everyone. It has been an incredible honor to have worked with young people from all over the world to work on this paper that highlights our feelings and hope as climate concern young people. You know, just as Sasha mentioned, we're all really fascinated at how much we had in common, even though we came from different parts of the world. Now, historically, young people's inclusion in climate discourse have been largely ignored and tokenist at best. This paper provided us a rare opportunity to have our voices heard, and this has been extremely empowering for us. I do hope that mental health professionals, government leaders, parents, and other stakeholders pick up this issue and seek ways to work more collaboratively. For us in the Global South, this paper and other emerging spaces are now providing us you know, spaces for dialogue on climate action. They provide us space to validate our emotions and feelings. Personally, I've grappled with emotions like anger and frustration, but on the other hand, also joy and courage, working with young people who come together to say, we believe these emotions are valid, they shouldn't be pathologized, and we can all work together to move from fear to hope. Finally, I would like to say thank you so much to all the co-authors and everyone who has worked really hard to make this paper an issue a success. On behalf of the young people who worked on our paper, we are indeed grateful for space to validate these emotions. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you. I am so inspired by you all, and I'm sure that anyone listening will be uh, as, as well. So, you know, all that remains is for me to say, let's get out there and build that more compassionate future that our young people are asking for. Thank you all so much for attending this webinar. Thank you.